Uh, hi everybody, thanks for coming. Um, so we'll be talking about generative programming and declarative interfaces. The title is a little bit different than in the program. I figured that represents what I'll be actually talking about more accurately. Um, first of all, I wanted to say a little bit about myself. I'm a long-term C++ enthusiast. I've um, been using the language for probably more than 10 years now. Um, Kind of what I like about C++ is uh, its ability to combine lower level um, close to the metalness with this um, notion of type safety and building zero cost abstractions that make it easier for us to actually work sanely in environments that well, are close to the metal or are performance critical or resource constrained for instance. Uh, my main experience is from game console emulation. So, if you ever try to play um, Nintendo GameCube, Wii, 3DS, Sony PSP games on a computer, there's a decent chance you used one of the emulators that I contributed to. Um, it's a very interesting field. Um, you can learn a lot about hardware architecture, um, obviously a lot about software design, and well, uh, you get to meet a lot of awesome people in the community. So if anybody's looking for a side project, I definitely recommend checking out the emulation scene. Um, I do occasionally post about this kind of things and other stuff on Twitter and I have a GitHub account, so if you want to follow me on there, feel free to. And a quick shameless plug, uh, I'm working as a freelancer in the Berlin area in Germany, so um, if you have a project or a project idea and need somebody to help you with that, um, feel free to talk to me later or send me an email. All right, cool. What's this talk actually about? Um, surprisingly, perhaps, about serialization. It's perhaps something uh, that wasn't quite evident from the title, but it turns out serialization is actually a very centric problem in emulation uh, for various reasons that I'll explain later. And we see, in particular, for um, the interprocess communication subsystem and the Nintendo 3DS, how that manifests and what kind of problems turn, out, uh, turn up. Uh, we will see how generative programming techniques help us deal with that kind of situation. How can we ease the job of the programmer? And how can we make sure things are actually working correctly? Uh, so we will see that. Um, and what part of that can actually be automated and what options do we possibly have? And finally, um, this is the part about the declarative aspects. Is how can we maximize reuse across the solutions that we come up with? So, yeah, quite the interesting things. Um, to il illustrate to you how serialization is such a centric problem in emulation, let's look at the typical high-level um, structure of, well, high-level software. Um, so this is a very, very view from a bird's eye, so to speak. Uh, we can see there are four-ish components. Um, on the left side, we have two prototypical uh, software side modules. So, um, just things that are in the software and live in different modules, different groups of C++ functions and structures. And obviously they need to interact with the hardware, for instance with the GPU or with an audio chip, and with the operating system. To make this a little bit more concrete, let's look at well, an example of a game where this might be the main application thread, a scripting engine, a GPU, um, and the operating system. And uh, these components can interact with each other. Uh, the simplest example is probably there's just the main thread trying to do things on the scripting engine. And the interaction between those two models for the programmer is trivial because the main thread is just calling a C++ function in the scripting engine. There's nothing to that. Uh, similarly, um, but somewhat more complicated but still trivial, when the main thread tries to, for instance, read a file using system calls and as such tries to interact with the operating system, um, it's basically still calling C++ functions. Like there, you need to make sure that you're using the right calling conventions, the right, right um, putting the right, right values into the right registers. Um, but at the end of the day, this stuff is just handled by the compiler. You just make sure all the functions are annotated using the right calling conventions and it's just done. And the only really non-trivial case is when you're trying to interact with the GPU or more precisely with the GPU driver because then you would actually need to not call a C++ function but just mem copy things around. But then that's it, you know, you have your structures, you mem copy them to a GPU driver visible memory and that's it. 
uh, everything else is on a GPU driver side and the game doesn't need to worry about that. So games have it simple, it's easy for them. Let's look at what an emulated game looks like in an emulator. There we have a virtualized CPU, a virtualized GPU, and a virtualized OS. So basically the same components as we would have in the original game, just that everything is virtualized. And um, you might think, you know, the virtualized GPU just sends data to the virtualized GPU. It's that easy. But in actuality, it's somewhat more involved because what actually happens is that the virtualized CPU interacts with main memory. Uh, it just basically writes raw data, so for instance, vertex data, somewhere into memory, and only then it actually gets sent to the virtualized GPU. But see, all of the stuff on the left side happens internally. It's kind of emergent behavior from the virtualized environment. And on the right side, this is us. So we only see this untyped sea of raw data. There's, we have no structure in there, so we kind of need to you know, find what actually, we try, need to try to make sense out of this untyped data is the point. So it's possibly a somewhat unconventional use of the word deserialization. But ultimately, that's what it is. We have serialized data, we don't have any structure, and we try to reintroduce type structure onto it. And similarly, um, like if a, the virtualized CPU were to do a system call over to the virtualized OS, um, it wouldn't go through main memory, but through the CPU registers. And similarly, we would lose the type information like that, and we would have to restore it over on that end. So hopefully that gives you a vague idea about why we're talking about this. Um, some more examples, well, system calls are what I was just explaining. Inter-process communication is the case where we have data and memory and need to deserialize function call arguments, which we'll be talking about later in this talk. Emulated file I.O. is possibly a more standard use of the word serialization. You just have a file on disk and want to load its data onto a C++ structure. Um, just that an emulation it's somewhat more involved possibly because our platforms tend to have a different NDNS than, um, well, than on regular applications. So like for each member in the C++ track, we usually need to byte swap everything and that makes things a little bit more annoying. And the last thing is GPU command buffers similar to the picture I showed before. Cool. So the question now is how can we do these things and all the other things that are not listed on there, how can we do that reliably? Uh, a lot of uh, issues that may turn up. Um, most importantly, it just doing it properly requires a lot of boilerplate. Uh, imagine you were having a raw chunk of memory loaded from a file, and you, know, you try to load it into a C++ structure with 100 members, and for each member you need to byte swap. It's just 100 redundant lines of code, which is just, it doesn't add any main benefit to the program, it's just annoying boilerplate that we have to deal with. Similarly, we have to make sure that we validate all inputs that we get, for instance, in a system call or in an inter-process communication command. Um, for instance, if there is a precondition like only positive parameters are accepted, we need to make sure that's given. Uh, lastly, we need to detect invalid states in the in emulated system. Uh, sounds somewhat abstract. What I mean with that is that a system call, what would be weird for an application to have a file descriptor or an, a kernel object, for instance, that is used as a file descriptor in one system call and as a mutex in another system call. You'd expect kernel object handles to be referring to the same kind of object consistently. And we want to detect that, but how can we do that without you know, wasting hours of time um, coming up with this stuff? Basically, today's goal will be let the compiler do for that, because that solves all the problems. Right, um, a particular example that I just wanted to very briefly um, touch to, touch at is the system call emulation that you might have on the Nintendo 3DS, for instance. Um, the way this works is the virtual CPU has a bunch of registers, um, I believe it's actually 16 of them on ARM, um, and they're pre-filled with some values. They're just pre-filled with some values, which the game probably has a meaning to, but as an emulator, we don't really know. At some point, the game will then use an SVC instruction giving a system call index that tells us execute system call 0x55 uh, based on these, uh, well, kind of arguments. 
Um, and when we do that in the virtualized operating system, um, we want to catch the system call and just implement it using a high level C++ function. Um, the C++ function doesn't work on registers, it just works on regular C++ variables or values. So we need to find a way to convert this stuff over here into this stuff over there. And there are two issues to consider here. First one being, things aren't nice. <laughs> you would expect R0, the first register, to contain the first argument of the system call. R1 to contain the second one, etc. That's not how it works though. Actually, the first argument is contained in R1, the second one in R2, third one in R3, and just because we like making things weird, the fourth one is stored in R0. Um, so that's how it works. And the second thing we need to take care of is for some of the registers, for instance, for R1 over here and R3 over here, these are kernel object handles. And we don't want, really want internally to work with raw handles, but we actually want to translate those into some sort of C++ object. So in addition to just reordering these arguments, we also want to look up those handles internally. Um, so that's a lot of fun, um, a lot of uh, to talk about for that. It's not actually the topic for today's talk, but I wanted to refer to it uh, for reference purposes. I presented this at C++ London uh, back in February. Um, so if you're interested in that, it uses similar techniques to what I'm presenting today, but it's just a diff slightly different twist on it and also somewhat more beginner accessible. So if you're interested, give it a, a, give it a go. Uh, other than that, um, the actual topic of this talk will be inter-process communication. And as an intro to that, maybe let's look at what the Nintendo 3DS looks like in the first place. So Nintendo 3DS is Nintendo's current um, handheld generation, which is quite surprising because it was actually released in 2011. So it's quite long lasting uh, for this kind of industry. In terms of the hardware, I like to say that it's sort of a big embedded system. So um, it's kind of comparable to smartphones at the time of the release. Uh, it's powered by two ARM 11 cores with the ARM v6 instruction set, uh, powered at reasonably high clock rate. Uh, it has a unique GPU, um, at least I don't really know any other devices that have the Pika 200. Uh, it's a really fun GPU, by the way. Um, and it boasts relatively uh, large amounts of RAM to work with as well. So this hardware is reflected in the software stack as well. So um, the 3DS doesn't run on a standard Linux distribution or anything. It's way too weak for that. Well, not way too weak, but it would steal all the resources off from games. But games also don't run just on bare metal. There is actually a, f a proper microcon underlying everything that manages permissions, that allocates memory, um, <coughs> and which handles synchronization, for instance. Um, an interesting twist is that it's fully multi multitasking and multiprocessing even. And Nintendo actually used this architecture quite effectively um, to basically reduce um, the privileges that a game actually can do. So, if an attacker were to intrude the system and um, try to do nasty stuff, they wouldn't really be able to do a lot um, because access is very heavily restricted. And the way they implement that is by using so-called, well, not so-called, but by using microservices, which are basically separate processes from the main application running just in parallel, and each of which provides a different piece of functionality. So you might have one microservice, or well, one process handling the GPU driver, you might have one handling um, the audio communication and others doing network, for instance. Well, and of course, at the end, you have the game itself that is currently running, or if you fancy that, the web browser. Some people like that. Um, in terms of emulation, we have four layers that are slightly different uh, in the system. So at the bottom, we have the actual ARM 11 CPUs, of course, which we just emulate using a plain interpreter, for instance, or a dynamic recompiler. Um, so it basically just goes for each instruction and re-implements the behavior on the virtual registers. At the very top, we have the game or the browser which runs on this emulated CPU. So we don't really directly emulate anything about the game. We just emulate the ARM 11 CPU. And then we load the game's binary image somewhere into memory, point the emulated CPU onto it, and just execute the program's code one by one. Um, what makes things slightly more interesting, though, is the kernel. 
because the kernel, we could do the same. We could load the kernel image into memory, point the emulated CPU at it, and have it well, basically run the kernel just like on the native system. But the kernel has a very well-defined interface, so we don't really need to do that. What we can do instead is whenever we see an SVC instruction, so a system call, we just hook into a native C++ function and, well, emulate the behavior directly rather than um, going through the heavy processing steps of emulating the kernel directly. And then a kind of hybrid, hybrid thing is the services themselves, because they're kind of like games, but they also have a very well-defined interface. Think of a GPU driver. Well, obviously the GPU driver will have to have a well-defined interface, otherwise games wouldn't be able to use it. So we kind of do the same thing. We just look at the interface of the services, and whenever the game tries to communicate with them, uh, we just call a C++ function and do the same thing. Uh, and this interaction between the game and the services is precisely the topic of this talk. Because, as we were saying before, services are just separate processes on the system. So the way they interact with each other is inter-process communication. And that means serialization is involved, and you probably can see where this is going. Right. Um, that's actually in the next section. Cool. So, as I was saying, IPC is really crucial to everything because you need IPC and the process communication to talk to other processors. So, you need it to render graphics, to play audio, to access Wi Fi, to connect to your Nintendo's social media platform, for instance, or even just to load any assets or save, save games on the game. Um, yeah, the processors also have various names, they aren't really too important. The important part is there are about 40 of them. <coughs> so, and that's a kind of a lot, which will be quite relevant later. Um, the protocol, mm, just to give you a small overview, is relatively simple. It's a client-server architecture, the games being the clients and the services being servers. Uh, it basically works like that, that the game is preparing a sort of re request message, sends it to the services, um, the services process that and then send a response back. And that entire thing works based on command blocks. I'll visualize how these specifically look later. Um, the thing is, they don't communicate directly with each other, but instead they go through the operating system kernel. So that's quite relevant in case sensitive data is being exchanged. So obviously you wouldn't want to um, just map arbitrary pointers into target processes, for instance. That would be uh, quite the security nightmare. Right, and the last point is that they're using this protocol based on a hierarchy system. So games only really have access to about 10 or 20 different services, uh, which provide high level functionality. And those services in turn have access to the other underlying 40, well, other 20 processes. So for instance, the GPU driver um, is the only thing a game could actually access, um, but the actual power control for the um, GPU, so the, M, the microcontroller unit managing the power supply, that's out of touch for the, uh, for the game. But the GPU driver, of course, in turn, needs to be able to access that. Right. Cool. So I need to do some trickery now because the animation isn't quite working the way I like it to. Um, this is why Indeed, indeed. <laughs> No, I actually do not recommend using SVGs for animations. <coughs> that turns, not to, turns out not to work too well, apparently. Right, cool. Mm -hmm. I still messed it up, but oh well. Uh, so this is just a picture of how this looks like. Um, ignore that one, you're not supposed to see that. <laughs> Basically, uh, let's say an application tried to read some file on the file system. Uh, the way it does that is it prepares this kind of command block on the left. And you can probably tell right now, you have no idea what the data in here means. That's what I'm getting at with untyped C of raw data. We just see this and we don't really know per se what it means. But let's walk you through it. So in the beginning, there's always a so-called command header, um, which gives us three pieces of information. The first one being this 800 here, that is a command ID. Uh, the command ID tells us what kind of operation should be executed. So in this case, it tells us the application wants to read a file. That simple. The uh, number on the right here gives us a number of um, 
UN32 values that should just be copied over to the servers. So that refers to these five values over here. These are just taken without modification and fed through to the servers. The two here is quite interesting though, because that tells us um, the number of things that follow. And these are kind of special parameters. These are the ones about the sensitive data I was alluding at before, where the kernel needs to do some sort of you know, reallocating memory or remapping memory under different permissions uh, to, be, to protect sensitive data from being uh, exploited for malicious purposes, for instance. Right, um, so that's how it works. And if we can get this working, nah, not quite. Maybe. Okay, cool. Anyway, so what happens is when this request is fired off, the kernel just goes for these five things one by one and copies them over here. The animation is playing way too quickly. But basically what happened um, is that these five values were just copied verbatimly into this intermediate staging buffer. But for these two, it was doing this translation process, which you can see right here. So it's a different buffer address down here. Then, uh, once that was... Why, why do you do that? Pardon? Why, do you, why does it translate buffer? Why does it change the buffer address? Um, so the question was, why does it um, translate the buffer address? Uh, it depends on the particular kind of um, special parameter that would be used, but uh, one thing you could imagine happening for a write operation rather than for a read, um, you would want the target process to only be able to read the data that needs to be written. You wouldn't want to, be, to have the service be able to override the read-only data over here. And to do that, you basically need to map it to a different virtual address and re-protect it under different access permissions. So you, you, have like a, you have two virtual addresses that are doing one that's a, a write uh, uh, version and one that's just read-only version. Yeah, more particularly, even these are separate processes, so they don't have a shared oh, okay. virtual memory gotcha. spaces in the first place. So th that's another thing, actually, uh, even if it weren't for the security aspect, um, this needs to be translated simply because they are different virtual memory spaces. Right, cool. And what you've been seeing before, let's just play it once more time. Once it's done copying all of this data, soon, kernel will move this intermediate staging buffer over to the actual service process. And then this GRE here symbolizes that the service is doing some sort of processing. And the idea is then, um, once it's done processing, the service will wipe off the, all of the data in the uh, command block and overwrite it with a response. So basically, the entire process starts in reverse. We're moving the response block back to the kernel. The same translation process happens again. And then finally, the application actually gets its result back. So in this case, it would be like some sort of success code and a number of bytes that have actually been read from the file, just like you would call um, know it from like F read, for instance. Um, right, so how do we actually emulate this? Uh, this is a five-step process, basically. So I've been mentioning before, we have this um, command header in the beginning, and it tells us which operation we have. So basically, our emulation starts at this point. The service has its buffer and needs to look at it and see what needs to be done. So we look at this command ID right here. It tells us a file should be read. So we first select a C++ handler function corresponding to that file read operation. So in this case, it's just a function called do read file. It takes four parameters. So this could be a, like a file descriptor. This could be a file offset, a number of bytes to be read. And this is the actual buffer that should receive the data to be read. And the result is just, um, well, the return value of that function is just a result code and a number of bytes read. So this has nothing to do with emulation, technically. This is just a C++ function. Everybody understands that. And we need to find a way to glue this function into what we actually have, which is the command block. So to do that, first we need to make sure that the command block actually fits to that function. Um, we have the information about the number of regular value-based parameters and the number of special parameters. And they better really match these um, these parameters. Uh, worth noting, this is counted in UN32s, so this is a 5 rather than 3, corresponding to 1 plus 2 plus 2. Once that is done and successfully been verified, we need to parse and decode the actual parameters from the command block. So this is like an example. 
Um, for the UN32 in the beginning, it's easy. We just take the entry, um, basically forward it to this parameter. For the UN62, we need to read two consecutive values and piece them together properly. And for this buffer descriptor, we basically um, need to construct um, such a buffer pointer custom type. And then finally, once we have all of that, we need to actually invoke the C++ handler function. That's easy. We need to look at its return type and then based on that, write the response back into the command block. So uh, we can write a command header, we write a result, hopefully success. And finally, a number of bytes read. Obviously, these are just bogus values for now, but it tells you how this one maps here and this one ends up being here. Cool. Um, now you might ask yourself, is this really a lot of effort? It kind of fits on a single slide. It doesn't seem too bad. But let's, let's actually do the maths. Let's see how much it actually is. How often do we need to write this logic for each IPC command? So first of all, consider there are about 40 active processes running on the system. Maybe 10 or maybe 20, uh, considering the number that are actually accessible via games. Cool. How many commands are there per process? Well, about 30 on average. Um, there are fun ones, though, which hopefully I've opened right here. Yeah. So this is the file system service. Uh, each of the entries in this table is a single IPC command. You can see the table goes down quite a bit. Um, yeah, you get the idea. There are a lot of them. And for each of these IPC commands, we need to write manual glue to actually get from the IPC command buffer onto the C++ handler. So that's clearly a lot of work. Or is it? Because this is where generative programming comes into play. Um, I've kind of tried to summarize the ideas and core building blocks of this in this nice little diagram. Take this with a grain of salt. However, basically at the center of it all is type lists. Type lists give us a notion that we can apply well-known template metaprogramming techniques on and basically based on which one we can um, generate actual runtime code. Think of a tuple for each function where for each entry in the tuple, for instance, a parameter list, we uh, call a decoding function, for instance. The question, of course, is where do we actually get the type lists from? And small spoiler ahead, what we will do is we will actually get it from the function itself. And we will use C++'s existing but very limited reflection facilities to do so. More concretely, in our scenario, we have the function do read file, just like before, taking four parameters. And it kind of includes all the information we really need. Because we know it takes three regular value-based parameters, one kind of special translate-based parameter, and it returns two plain value-based parameters. So that's all the information we really need. However, with C++, we can't really do anything with function signatures. Like we can call functions, but it's not like we could count the number of these things directly. To do so, we need function traits. Function traits basically allow us to turn this function signature into two separate type lists. The first one being the request list, which is just a list of arguments to the function. So you see the UN32 here, the UN64 here, etc. And similarly for the response list, it's just two tuples that tell us precisely what we need. And this is a much better mechanism for, or a much better mean to actually do anything useful with. So we will use what I call generators to um, a loop over each of these tuple elements and basically create decoding and encoding logic, uh, which we need to actually invoke the handler. And once that's done, we will try to combine all of this together into a very simple, very single function called glue command handler, which just takes a command block and the handler to invoke. And that is literally all we need, we need to do for each IPC command. So I hope this gives you a somewhat motivation of where we're going and how tremendously easier this will make our job. Cool. So uh, basically, this will be what the next third of the talk will be. And then the last third of the talk will be about the declarative approach that we'll uh, build on top of that. So function traits. Uh, I'm assuming everybody knows what type traits is. It's basically getting information 
about a type at compile time and a function trait is just that, but for functions or specifically function types. Um, the two most interesting properties of a function are parameter list and return type. Um, basically, we want to write a template class or struct um, that has two members, one being the argument list, uh, one being the results list, where it's worth noting that this results list in our case will always still be a tuple because that's what our handler functions always return. So I won't bore, you, won't bore you with a full implementation of this thing because they already exist. There are two libraries available, um, at least one of them actually being included in Boost. Uh, it's called Boost Function Types and supports very old versions of C++. I'm not actually sure how far it goes back. Um, and there is Boost Callable Traits, which I'm not actually sure is actually in Boost. It is, okay, cool. Um, <coughs> but there's also a standalone version, just in case anybody uh, doesn't want to include Boost in their entire project or something. Right, for our purposes, um, it's very easy to implement a minimal um, function traits uh, functionality. And that basically works by using partial template specialization. The idea is just we have our general uh, function traits for what declaration, but then we actually specialize it using the function result and the function arguments, um, which might seem somewhat counterintuitive, but that's just how, it, just how it works. We will match all functions with this function result and the function arguments. And then magically we just re-export them and well, get what we want, proper function traits. So that's very limited. It only works for free functions. It doesn't even work for free function for function pointers, I believe, but good enough for now. It could be trivially modified. modified to multiplexer, right? Yeah. yeah, like it's literally just inserting a star yeah. here. So, right. Um, basically, um, if you wanted to come up with this kind of stuff on from scratch, uh, this is really easy for anything that is not a pointer to a member function or anything like that. For pointer to member functions, it gets really ugly, and if you need to have those, I recommend using one of those libraries because it just makes your job much easier. Right, cool. So we got the type lists now because that's what our function traits just give us. How do we actually generate runtime code from that? So that's how the generators get in. Uh, there are a couple of means we can, mechanisms we can use to do this kind of generations, the two legacy-ish means our recursion, so you just always generate code for the first type list element and then recurse onto the rest of it. Uh, or you use a um, metaprogramming library like Boost MPL, for instance, and use it uh, for each tuple function and just call a polymorphic function handler in each of the tuple elements. What we'll be using instead, however, are parameter pack expansions, which have been introduced in C++11, uh, and fold expressions, which both of which are just much easier to work with and basically allow you to write really readable um, generators as we'll hopefully see in a minute. Cool. Yeah, question is now, how do we write such a generator for the command block decoder? Um, to do so, we just dive right into it. So just for a reminder, we have this kind of request list from our function traits. Um, so this is the values that we need for the uh, command handler as arguments. And this is the serialized data in the command handler annotated with the actual things. So we obviously don't have that information. We only have these values. And we want to write a template, um, basically a function object uh, called decode all and apply um, that takes the type list. But actually, we want to work with variadic templates. So let's just partially specialize it using that so we get that. And there are three elements to this function object. The first one being the state. It's a stateful function object. Uh, it just points into the command block right to the first, um, first entry in the command block, skipping the command header because we already passed that one. And then we have a utility function that is used to decode one individual entry based on its type. Um, it will return the value that has been decoded and advance the offset in the current command block. The implementation will be shown on the next slide, but once we have that, what we'll do is we will write a function call operator that basically does all of the traversal of the command block and return us this thing. Um, 
And to do so, we basically just write this expression, decode command entry with the current command entry type of the command block and then put these three dots on here. So that's just how a parameter pack expansion works. The small twist here is that I will actually feed these, this expanded results right into the function call handler. So it might have been more immediate to return a tuple of all those results and then apply this tuple to the handler. Um, however, that has the disadvantage that you create the intermediate tuple and may hinder your optimizer in generating uh, optimal code. So I found this pattern of um, doing the parameter expansion and invoking the handler directly quite useful. And maybe that's useful beyond emulation in general as well. Cool. So how do we implement decode entry? Let's look at it. The simplest case is just the decoding of 32-bit values. But you see the first issue is we obviously want a different implementation of this for each of the given types. We want a different one for a UN32, UN64, and for writable buffer. So now you could go ahead and you know, do a partial template specialization and then realize, hey, this doesn't actually work here. Oh, well, um, in C++17, we can just use if const expr, though, which makes it really, really easy to do so, because we can just write if const expr and check that it's a UN32, and then do the UN32 specific logic. And otherwise, we just cascade into other if const expr conditions that I'll show later. If it is a UN32, what we want to do is we read the command block entry at the current offset. We return that from the function. And after that, we post increment the offset to move on to the next element. That's easy. Um, for 64-bit values, it's somewhat more involved. Of course, we again also just catch the element type with if const expr. But we now need to pass two consecutive elements at once because we want to construct a single UN64 value based from two entries. So we just read one value, increment the offset, um, read the other one, and then we just stitch them together and return them to the caller. Cool. And the last one needs a little bit more complicated logic as well. Again, we catch it using if const expr, but now we want to pass this buffer descriptor first. I will not bother you um, with how that's specifically done, but basically it gives us the size of the buffer back and like some sort of read writable flags. We do that, then we read the next element, which is the buffer address, and then we just return a constructed writable buffer object based on these two values. Right. So that basically gives us everything we need, just to give you an overview again. Um, we have the stateful function object and the function call operator here basically takes care of the entire traversal of this thing automatically and forwards the past arguments into the function call handler. Does anybody see any issue with that code by any chance, by the way? Uh, so this is C++17? It is, yeah. Uh, did they uh, specify the order of evaluation of uh, function uh, yes. parameters to a function? Yeah, okay, so that's not an issue. Oh, that's interesting. Otherwise, so there's, there's all the versions, like, uh, oh, no, not the function. Sorry, not the function. Not the function. So that probably is everything else. <laughs> so the remarks have been that, um, or rather, the first question was whether C17 um, introduced a well defined order of evaluation and function call arguments. Uh, there was some uncertainty whether that was the case or not, but apparently we settled that it is not the case. They just can't be interviewed. Right, okay. That would be a bug in this code then, right? Because your offsets wouldn't work again. And that's precisely the issue I was talking about. Oh. Right. <laughs> because, fix me, execution order is undefined. I'm hoping I might be able to sneak in a lightning talk about how to make it uh, well, better defined. Uh, because it's actually really simple to make, uh, make it well defined if you know how to. Um, there's basically a utility class that you can do to just wrap it around in that, and it's just fine then. Uh, if I'm not getting any slot, I will. Um, a bonus slide about right, this. And yeah, that's basically the idea. The remark was that you could use uh, initializer lists and they have a well defined order. That's basically the idea. Okay, I will add a bonus slide about this in the PDF then. Cool. But basically, that's just a side issue. Yes? Uh, 
So you mm. just, uh, do, I don't know, something like uh, uh, map or fold if you want to uh, first iterate over each one argument and then uh, put them into one tuple. Mm. Then, for example, you can call unpack and everything will be in the order. Yep. Uh, the Wemark what? The only issue here is that you get the offsets in the right order. Otherwise, you don't care about the order of uh, evaluation. So you can make a defaulted template parameter in the generic template at the top that is a sequence of indexes and then do the indexes compile time rather than the runtime bumping of them up and then the order of evaluation would be important. Right. So the remarks have been, uh, first one is to solve the execution order problem. We could use a library like Boost Tanner and um, basically store this one in a tuple is the suggestion, isn't it? And then use the utility function like HANA apply, for instance. Uh, yes, that, but uh, there is a problem. You, you cannot use SPG tuple. You have to use... You do, yeah, tuple. we would have to use HANA tuple. That's not a big issue, but though. You can use SPG tuple. All right, uh, maybe so, yeah. The other remark, um, if I may paraphrase that again, was that basically the only reason we need a well-defined execution order here is because of the offsets. And the idea was to instead do something like um, pass the offsets of each particular element uh, as an additional tuple to the um, decode all and apply That's structure. Right. It wouldn't be trivial to someone in the bucket too. Okay. Yeah, that, 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 that kind of stuff gets ugly really quick yeah. is the issue. Whereas this is reasonably simple. It's well, it's tricky, but... Size size. Pardon? We calculate the, the offset that each one has and then just be partial size. Yeah. 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 yeah, of course. Or you just use a partial size tuple. Yeah. 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 Um, so this was maybe a little bit theoretical, maybe not, but regardless, I wanted to show it off in practice, and this is going to be really fun now, because I have to figure out which one is my right terminal. I thought that for 17, what we ended up saying for the evaluation order of our use, not that it's un, uh, unspecified, but that it's either one or the other, that it's, it's, uh, you said it's implementation. what? The implementation defined. Yes, yeah. Okay. That later. Yeah. So there have been remarks in the room yeah, about. There has been some further discussion about evaluation order. <laughs> uh, maybe not paraphrase this one now. <laughs> um, there seems to be a lot of uncertainty either way. So, demo time. Um, I basically just paraphrased all of the structures we've seen so far, and you cannot read that. Yeah. Is this one fine for the last row? Yeah. Cool. Um, uh, you should shrink it a little bit, because we're missing the first three characters of every line. That's true. There we go. Is that good? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, so first of all, I just wrote dummy structures for the command block. As you can see, it's just a 16 by um, 16 element array of U and 32s. Um, that's really not, nothing fancy, and read U32 just gives us the data at a given offset. I've implemented writable buffer. It's just a pair of address and size with a stream out operator and some utility functions. Don't really care about those. What we do care about is the decode and apply function, which you can see does not fit on the entire screen. <laughs> uh, but at least the read entry element does. So you can see it's just what we've seen on the slides. No surprises here. Um, yeah, and this is my call with sequential evaluation macro. It's just a macro because I didn't want to spoil how it actually looks. <laughs> right. And then here is an example handler that I came up with, which is just called do stuff. It's basically the same thing as read file from before just that it returns just a single end and doesn't take a second, you and the 64. 
Cool. So for the purpose of saving time, um, I will actually just copy paste some stuff around. So the idea is we basically want to create a command block on the fly now. But let's pretend this is something an application send us. Um, and I've prepared something for this, which is this command buffer. Um, which is clearly just a bunch of dummy elements. But possibly interesting for you uh, is this um, the special value, which has this kind of structure for the um, for the descriptor, which basically has this one indicate what kind of element follows, and this one is a size-ish thing. But again, it's just a dummy value. So if we try to comp well, <laughs> and obviously we want to actually now decode this thing and call do stuff on the decoded values. So we call decode all and apply. How many typos did I insert in there? None, that's surprising. <laughs> and we call that on the command block, which doesn't have a variable name yet. And on our do stuff function, I believe I need double parentheses here. Maybe not, maybe I do. Right, and if we now try to compile this, and execute it, we see that it doesn't compile. Also, I should increase the font size again. Right. That's because we do need one template parameter. Which one do we need? Oh, yeah, I totally betcha that one, actually. <laughs> um, what did I actually mean to do here? Oh, OK. This one does need the entire um, type list. Obviously, because that's what you would get from function traits, which I haven't implemented in here. All right. So again, I will copy paste this one. Maybe it works now. Nope. Well, this is fun. Right. So it's function object. So obviously, we first need to actually create it using curly braces. And then we, we invoke the actual function call operator on it. And hopefully, it now works. Yes, it is. And as you can see, um, it gives us exactly what we want. So the do stuff function first printed hello world and then prints each of the arguments that we pass to the thing. Um, this one in particular using our custom OStream operator. So that's all good. Um, for demonstration purposes sake, let's see what happens without my um, call with sequential evaluation macro. I believe that's good. It just still works, isn't that awesome? OK, what happens if we use Clang? <laughs> ah, OK. So with Clang, oh, that, that's interesting. That's even better than I expected. So with G++, <laughs> with G++ it just still works, because I guess in this particular case, GPCC was just evaluating in strict order after all. But Clang would be um, parsing the buffer in reverse order. You got a different value, though, after you change. You don't get the... Uh, oh, yeah, that's true. Behavior. Yeah, undefined, undefined behavior is great, isn't it? <laughs> right, I guess maybe it was still doing weird stuff and just not crashing in that case, and with Clang it just does reliably. Oh, well. Also, I'm somewhat concerned about those warnings, but this is fine. Let me just undo that because we will need it later. What, what is your macro there? Can you show us that? Uh, yeah, sure, of course, actually, if we have the time. Um, don't have any syntax violating on that one. So the question was whether I could show the fancy macro off. Um, basically, the idea is just. Uh, that instead of using the function and passing it the arguments, 
you use a custom class which has a constructor that takes the function and the expressions of the values that you try to pass to the function. The thing is, if you call this constructor <coughs> using curly braces, this will look like f, comma, and then all the expressions you're trying to call. And in an initializer list, or in curly brace initialization, all the expressions are evaluated in strict order. So that means f doesn't need to be evaluated, but all the expressions after will get evaluated in the right order. And then the task of this constructor is merely to, um, well, basically call f with the values which have been evaluated at, the, at that point already and store it in a result, which we can compute using template metaprogramming-ish. <laughs> Um, and then it just has a casting operator to the actual result type. Does that help? <laughs> cool. Well, fa fantastic. Now I don't need to do any bonus slides either, so it saves me some effort as well. Great. <clears throat> so uh, that's the part about the decoder um, that we wanted to have from our RPC command block. What's still left to do is the result encoder. So say our read file operation reported success um, and read 0xd00f bytes. Um, this is basically the same problem as before, just slightly different in how we actually do the um, full iteration. But again, we just have a structure called encode all. This time we're not interested in passing it to a function, so it's really just the encoder. It has an offset and it has an encode function, which I'll be omitting completely because there is no new information in here. And it has this function call operator, which now um, wants to execute this kind of expression for each of these types um, in strict sequence. So what we can do for that is we can use fold expressions introduced in C++17, and we can fold this expression over the comma operator, which strictly sequentializes evaluation order. This is somewhat evil, and people could be even more evil and make this return a type. Well, no, actually, it returns void, so that's fine. It should return void anyway. That's a typo. But yeah, that, that's basically just how it works, and there's nothing really new in here other than using fold expressions rather than parameter pack expansions. My question now is, I was promising you this really, really awesome glue command handler uh, thing. Let's see how it's implemented. Um, it's a really, really simple template function. It just takes its, uh, as its argument the handler and the command block. Uh, the first thing it does is it reads the request header. and It should do some verification about the request header, making sure that the parameters match and everything. That's somewhat complicated in our current framework, so I'll omit it for now. Um, after that, it would get the request list and response list from the function traits based on the handler. So this just tells us how many arguments need to be serialized and deserialized. And then it uses our decoder and applier to read all the arguments from the command block and apply them to the handler. Once that's done, we try to build a response header based on the results tuple and encode them all into the command block, after which it's just getting set back to the application. So that wasn't really too bad, was it? <laughs> um, we omitted these two implementation details. They are not really too difficult to do. We kind of need to traverse the request list and find the first special parameter. And then you need to make sure it's all ordered fine. It's a mess, but there's no really deeper insight in here. Anyway, this thing achieves all what we want. It can be used for every single IBC command, and it doesn't have any of the boilerplate issues from before. Cool. Um, right. So, are there any questions so far about what we've seen in the past 20 ish minutes? There are no questions. That closes this chapter. Um, if you want to summarize it, it's basically reflective generators or generators plus reflection, whatever you want to call it. But I promised you a different kind of uh, approach as well, and that is declarative generators. Um, and this is, I don't want to say it's a better approach, it's a different approach and it has its merits and drawbacks, uh, which you will see in a minute. Um, so I did want to present both of them because reflective generators are actually useful um, for me personally as well in the project I worked on. 
not an IPC, but for instance, in a system call emulation. But the IPC code that I wrote actually is based on this declarative approach. So what does it look like? Well, to do so, um, well, actually, we've got a new, new fancy diagram here. So we can use declarative interfaces as a way to sidestep this reflection step and basically just get a type list right away based on this uh, declarative interface. We will see what that looks like in a minute. So basically what we want from this is some sort of entity in the type system that captures all of the information about an IPC command that there is. So that's the command ID, of course, and four different type lists. First one being the value-based normal parameters. So just the first three parameters in our file reader. The special parameters that require pre-processing or translation. And then the same two things, again, for the response message. So these five things uniquely describe each IPCC command structure. Well, yeah, and for now for open file, we might have, for instance, three things here, IO flags, file attributes, UN32. There are just three UN32 values in total, basically. A request takes a static buffer, which I haven't touched on either, but it's one of those special fancy things as well. Response gives a file descriptor, which is just a plain value and contains no special parameters. So basically we want to have something that represents these four things and the command ID. Uh, directly. So um, there's a lot of trial and error that went into this. I'll spare you with the details, uh, and especially for the sake of time. We'll just show the actual solution that I came up with. Um, first thing is quite easy. Uh, we just want to encode the command ID. We do that by having a template class that just takes the command ID and re-exports it. It re-exports it so the public interface basically can uh, read this command ID later again. If we want to apply that, we could now have a namespace, like a file system that captures all file system related operations. And if a type called open file, describing open file operations, which is just this IPC command with ID 802. Um, and given that this thing is re-exported, now you can write something like open file command ID and that tells you exactly what ID corresponds to that. Of course, it doesn't include any of the other information yet. Now, we could just tag this right on the template list, you know, have a variadic template that tells us how many normal parameters they are, for instance. Instead, I opted for a different approach, though, which is to, well, yeah, and we can have a similar thing here. A different approach is to add a nested class called normal, and that is an actual variadic template. Uh, telling us each particular type of the value-based parameters to this command. Again, this is being re-exported as a tuple. That um, means that our open file is now being extended by this list of parameters. Of course, we're still not done, but you might see the pattern here. We just can nest more, more structures in here to add more information about this, um, this IPC command. Again, re-export them and consecutively build and add all the information we need about this thing. So this is confusing to you. Basically, just ignore it and look at the actual definition of the file system commands now, because it's kind of like a domain-specific language at this point already. It just tells us it has a particular command ID. It has a list of normal parameters. It has a list of special parameters. And if I wanted to, I could add the response parameters similarly as well. And you don't need to know anything about this. Uh, to understand what's going on around here. So that's kind of what I mean with declarative interfaces, because it just right away, without knowing any implementation details, tells you what it is. Right. Um, yeah, this is just a slide stressing how easy it is to extend it. Just add a new nested struct, re-export it, and add it down here, and you have the response information as well. Cool. Um, the order that these go in, right? The if, you, if you wanted people to be able to put them in any order, it would, it would be much more complicated. Yeah, the remark was that people need to remember the order. So you wouldn't be able to write uh, IPC command special empty normal. However, uh, that's actually a feature because um, the IPC subsystem on the 3DS does not actually support that kind of thing. Uh, 
Like you would not be able to put any special parameters before value-based parameters. Oh no, yeah, I just meant that you can't you can't put those parameters in. And, and, like yeah. they're, they're sort of tagged parameters, so or named parameters. So mm. one might think that you know they would just work in any order. Um, right. You have to do this in a specific order. Yeah, that's true. Um, all right. All right. Just to summarize, uh, basically this builder-like pattern. Um, referring to the builder pattern in uh, object-oriented programming, where instead of calling a constructor directly with big n values, you just have a separate class that has a number of member functions that are being chained together, and each of them sets up an individual um, aspect of the class. So that's similar because this one tells you you have an IPC command with a given ID, and just after you set up the normal list, then the special list, and then the response list. Um, that is done rather than having a single parameter list in a single go. Uh, because that is separated, um, we can actually handle multiple parameter packs. Um, we could have done that by having four different statuple parameters. Then we would have kind of lost the expressive aspect of this because uh, this one tells us what it actually is, whereas a statuple of this thing wouldn't have done that. Um, it enforces the type ordering, which again, I consider a feature, but it might con be considered a misfeature depending on how you look at it. Um, and it's easy to extend the interface uh, to include more information. Right, so basically this is now what, uh, well, this is a declarative style approach to describing the anatomy of a full IPC command. And the idea is basically that for each IPC command, we now would need to write one of those things. Cool, so of course, declarative style is nice and all, but it doesn't really achieve anything per se. What we want now is a generator that uses a declarative interface to actually do anything useful to actually generate runtime code. Uh, there's not a lot to this, to be honest though, because it just looks really similar to what we've seen before. Um, just that this command handler obviously doesn't need any function traits anymore now. Um, on the other hand, it needs an additional template parameter which is this IPC request, so the declarative interface. Other than that, we read the request header again from the top. We can now actually write down the verification logic, which is really simple because you can just include the expected request header in the declarative interface. I haven't done that in the previous slides, but it's easy to build that because it's just a static const expro blah blah thing. Um, after that, you just again call uh, decode and all and apply, this time using the request list contained in the declarative interface. Um, you create the response header. Again, you can just read it from the interface and you iterate over all the values that need to be encoded. Right. Um, so I don't have a slide for this, but basically a discussion about the merits and drawbacks about this. The main drawback is basically we introduced a hell of a lot of redundancy in this now. We previously had our approach with function traits and just magically deduced everything from the command handler and just did all the magic for us. We didn't need to do anything. So why am I proposing to do this now instead? Uh, why do we need to instead declare all of our IPC commands manually now? Well, the main benefit in my opinion is that it introduces a huge amount of flexibility. And that is because when I was originally researching different ways of how to do this, I was really only concerned about IPC handling. But once I had this declarative style approach, I realized I could actually do more. Um, I could all of a sudden, because I basically have all of the declarative um, definitions of the commands, I can do entirely different things from command handling. So I started looking at my um, fake services, so to speak, and considered, hey, could actually synthesize new IPC commands. I could just have my fake service call into other services. Basically, introduce an entire hybrid approach to um, how I'm doing this emulation. And all of a sudden, I didn't have to fake all of the services, but I could fake some services um, and properly emulate others. But they would still communicate in harmony just because, based on the declarative interfaces, I could construct command blocks on the fly and still write regular C++ code. And it didn't really stop there. Um, I was also able to hack my kernel, basically, to include in 
a database, so basically a big table of all the IPC commands that exist on the system. And using that table of um, IPC commands, I could add automated logging, logging everywhere. So the kernel wouldn't really know anything about what was going on. It just knows which process sent a message and it sees the command header. But based on these two pieces of information, it can guess, hey, this is a file system service. Um, it has the ID 802. This is probably a wheat file command. And it can write that to the logger and help me tremendously when trying to debug why some game doesn't work. Because previously, I was just looking at those raw command blocks. I have to figure it out on my own. But now it's just all automated and tells me what is actually happening. So that's this big flex um, flexibility because implementing this stuff doesn't really need a lot. It really does need a, needs a different generator at the end. And as you're seeing on the slide, writing these generators is really, really cheap. So hopefully that gives you an idea of um, where I'm going with this and why in the end I chose to go with a declarative style for my IPC command handling and other stuff. Right, so this is just the alternative um, compile time programming overview now. And we have, I believe the tablet went out. Um, okay, we have 24 minutes left. That is plenty. Um, there's a small mini demo, and it's not really a demo. I just wanted to show you some of the code that is actually being used in production in my emulator right now. Uh, because we've seen individual command headers, uh, individual command definitions, but how does it actually look like in practice? And you can see it's, it, it's complicated because they're, they're commands that take really, really long lists. But basically, this is what my project looks like. We have a lot of headers. This one is for the file system commands only. And a couple of lines, each specifying different commands. Uh, this is basically what the file goes down like. One, one thing I don't quite like about the current approach here is this thing. It's just a long list of UN32s. Each of these are individual values, but looking at the signature, we don't really know what they represent. Like, this could be, what is this? Quid? Okay, I don't know what this actually does right now. Um, but how can we distinguish the semantics of this one from this one? How do we distinguish sizes from offsets, for instance? Because uh, it's not like we can annotate this with any names or something. And that's kind of why I'm hoping uh, reflection, like proper reflection, will come through eventually in the standard. Because then we could do a kind of hybrid approach with um, reflection, well, with struct reflection again, where the declarative interface would be a struct with named parameters, um, so that we can actually see what a particular parameter means. But we would still have the declarative nature of the entire thing, so we can get the other advantages out of it. But yeah, so. Um, it gets a little bit better if you use strong types, like you can see, for instance, in this register function. Um, so this add serialized function basically is just a wrapper to insert and place all of the members of program info. Really cool stuff going on in there, but I'm afraid I don't really have the time to go into that. But yeah, just having those um, strong types makes it a little bit easier to see what's happening. Cool, so the actual command handler that I have, so probably the generator, looks a little bit more different because I've written it like two years ago or so and vastly simplified it when I was actually preparing the talk. But you can see there's a lot of similar things going on and what we see on the slide. So we've got this um, declarative interface with the request list and the response list. We've got some sort of verification logic. Uh, we are doing this kind of, um, Decoding, it's called TLS reading, but all well, same thing. Gathering it into a tuple in this case because I didn't know any better back then. Um, and this is calling the handler, doing some static assertions to make sure we're actually doing the same thing. Uh, that kind of stuff. Could you get the TC to read? Pardon? Oh, but then it's kind of hard to read the code. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't really. Should have probably picked a different color scheme for the presentation, sorry about that. Uh, anyway, it's just the same thing as on the slides anyway. This one isn't new. Uh, this one is the part where I synthesize IPC command blocks based on a particular message. Um, 
And you can see there's a lot of comments going on about all the hacks I put in there to make it work. Uh, but basically, it's not a lot of code um, either. So yeah, that's where it ends already. So that's what I'm trying to say when I say generators are cheap to write. It's just like 10, 20 lines of code, and you're implementing a vastly new piece of functionality. And that's only possible because we have the database of IPC commands already ready, and we're just reusing what's already there. Right. Uh, don't mean to, to show anything else. What is that? Oh, that's not too important. So you are using uh, on LFST people? Uh, in the actual production, sorry, who was asking? Right. <laughs> uh, in the actual production code it is, yeah, because that was written two years ago. And uh, it wasn't even written with C17 either. I believe I was still using C11 back then. So Possibly. What do you mean by production code? Is this like a game on a 3DS or something? Oh, no, that's the actual emulator code that I worked on. Oh. As opposed to the. Um, just this code on the slides, which isn't used anywhere <laughs> directly. One of these days, I will actually re revisit this code and actually make it more sane, but not today. Right, what else is there? Cool. Um, and a last thing, basically just fulfill the promise that I made in my abstract, uh, a digression about performance. <laughs> um, and there's really not a lot to say about this, uh, because at the end of the day, we're just taking a type list, which is completely a compile time entity, and executing a particular operation on each of the elements on there. So it's really not all that different from what, the, what you would write by hand in the first place. So naively, you would expect there not to be any overheads in the first place. I found it quite funny to actually look at the assembly output of um, the code sample I showed you before. So that was the one where we just had this um, do stuff function that just printed the contents of a command block um, by first decoding it into EN32, 64, and the writable buffer thing. So if we do that and compile it first again, And make sure it works still. <laughs> okay. Never do this at home, please. Don't include CPP files. <laughs> right, cool. Um, so this guy was a nice executable. I'm not sure which optimization level it actually uses by default. I would like to use O1, because um, otherwise you just get plenty of symbols that don't actually do anything. So, yeah. I've got this nice little disassembler. Um, right. So this is basically our entire main function. And we can see two function calls in here. First one being just this utility descriptor decoder. Doesn't really do much. And the bottom, the actual do stuff um, call. So it's quite interesting to see that even on a relatively low optimization level, uh, we're basically compiling down to just like, what is this, eight instruction or so? So that's quite nice. Um, actually, it actually gets a little bit better if we compile with O2 even. Um, because then it just inlines everything, like including the contents of the actual command block. Um, and it basically just um, initializes the values directly here into 64-bit registers and then calls the function directly. Um, what I didn't try out, and because we still have time, I might as well try it out, um, is to see what, what it actually does. If it doesn't have any definition for the command block available. Because then it obviously cannot inline anything either. It should have worked, shouldn't it? How does one use extern variables again? We don't have a definition of it. Oh, sorry. So just pass that C. Yeah, type out that one for some reason. Right, that makes more sense. 
Okay. So I haven't tried this, uh, this out at all, so this is totally an experiment now. This does not look good. <laughs> Does not look good at all. What well, actually does it look that bad? Oh, okay. Is this in house only? Pardon? Is this in house or, or or APK? Is it source destination or destination source? Oh, I have no idea. Destination source. Okay. Although I guess so. Here's our do stuff call at least. Yeah. And here's the function return. So it still doesn't leak. Uh, Seem like a whole lot. I do not know. I'm not really too practiced in reading x86 assembly anyway. Like, it, which it has to do. Yeah, it seems reasonable. I don't expect much smaller than that. I do wonder whether it's actually using 64 bit reads directly, though. Is that a thing even? Uh, the, the, the yes, it says the word. Oh, yeah, the word and keyword. That's cool. Well, so the keyword is going to be 64 bit, the other ones are. Right, okay, awesome. Which corresponds exactly to the one sixty-four bit parameter we have, so everything's nice, cool. Right. So that was a nice experiment. Um, that's basically all I wanted. Yeah, it's fast. <laughs> um, that's all I wanted to say, really. Just to conclude, uh, we've seen a couple of things. Um, hope we um, kind of memorized the untyped C or raw data, which makes emulation really, really hard in terms of um, actually trying to get well-typed information and using, well, structured programming in a sense and strong types because we need to reintroduce all of the type information from scratch onto the system. We've seen how we can do something like that using generators by just um, deserializing using a type list over the generator. Um, Ford expressions are quite nice for this. Um, not too much in the code I showed you, but if you th consider that things can just be summed up quite concisely using them, for instance, they're really, really big in terms of how they can simplify your code for these kind of things. We've seen how we can use reflection to um, synthesize these type lists just on the fly based on nothing but function signatures, which is really convenient. Um, your function traits now, it would really, really be useful to have full reflection eventually, maybe in C++23, maybe not. And we've seen the declarative interface that we can use for maximizing reuse just because you can build these databases of IPC commands and reuse them in all kinds of different things just by using different generators. And yeah, at the end, basically, this is a vastly more maintainable solution. It saves us from writing lots of repetitive boilerplate and it's just much more expressive as well. Um, all of that at basically zero overhead. So with that, uh, Thanks for your attention, and if there are any questions, you can open are it for you, that. Are uh, working on an emulator for the uh, Nintendo uh, Switch? There are a couple of people working on that, actually. I'm not too interested right now because I like to do the 3DS properly now. Um, but yeah, there's lots of interesting stuff going on there, especially because the Nintendo Switch is actually uh, um, very similar in terms of the architecture. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit more complicated because it's an actual stationary system, but yeah. Any other questions? Right. Let's have people take photos first. <laughs> I have a comment. You're awesome. <laughs> well, I, thank you, I guess. <laughs> well then, thanks again for the attention. Uh,